Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on today's show, a question about prayer and the persistent widow, and a question about la 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 la. And I'm not talking Christmas. All the way home, hubby. Warm. Right on, stick around. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Email. Hey Rev Fisk, I had a couple questions about prayer. Does the parable of the persistent widow teach that we ought to be persistent and repetitious in our prayer request, and that perhaps as a result of this be more likely that our request be answered favorably? Also, is there ever a point that we as believers can recognize that God has denied our request and we should stop praying for a specific thing, like the case of Paul's thorn in his flesh? That's a really interesting set of questions there, and in one sense you've answered your own question by recognizing that there are simply some prayers that God is not going to answer this side of the resurrection of the dead, as is the case with Paul's thorn in his flesh. We'll come to that in just a moment. But first, let's just dig into this whole persistent widow thing. What you've got your finger on there is a way that many people do teach this parable, that the point of this parable is that, like the persistent widow with the unrighteous judge, we'll read about that in just a sec, you also should go to God repeatedly, and as a result of your constantly banging on his door, he will answer your prayers. The problem with this right off the bat is that it puts prayer back into that realm of magic. We we got got Liviosa. Yeah. where we're basically having this power within ourselves to manipulate, constrain, and control God. While it is entirely true that God is listening to us because in Christ we are his children, and so just as Abraham of old was able to change God's mind by praying, by talking to him, and bring about a different result for the present circumstances he saw, nonetheless, this doesn't mean that God has basically submitted ourselves to him so that if we get more people praying for us or pray more often, he's more likely to answer. Pray. Or Mojo. He's really not that petty, yeah? It's not like he's up there and he's just so needy. And if only, like Tinkerbell, hearing the children clap and snap, we could all just get our noise up into his general direction, then he'll have more power to do what he wants. So, well, let's look at the parable of the persistent widow itself and see what Jesus says the meaning of the parable is, because it's really something quite different. And while it does have to do with prayer, it really isn't about you and what you can do to make God happier with you and more likely to bless you than he already is. Help us even tonight to reprogram our software, our thinking, to come up a little bit higher. That would be to say it's not about how you can justify yourself before God. Which, have you noticed, it kind of always comes back to this question on one side or the other. Either someone is teaching that what the Bible says is that you need to justify yourself before God, or they are teaching that the Bible says that you are justified by God for the sake of the grace he's given in Jesus Christ to create faith and trust and restore you to a relationship with him, out of which indeed do flow good works, but good works aren't really so much the point as God's own eternal imputed righteousness. Yeah, as issues etc. is want to say, it's not about you, it's about Jesus for you. Hmm? All right, Luke chapter 18. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. A little Greek work here real quick. Now, while that is a fine translation of the literal Greek text, it does kind of carry along with it the connotation that this is about repetition, you know, that you will be heard because of your many words, rather than here is the real emphasis that you would not lose heart. That is, to say the Greek is more concerned with you understanding from this parable the necessity that you not be discouraged or be weary or be afraid of praying. It's not like God isn't listening to you. In fact, that is the point. The point of the entire parable is going to show us that God is listening to you the first time you pray. In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, I always begin most of my decisions in the day as well in the same way, though I neither fear God nor respect man, I think I shall go to Starbucks today. It's just kind of, you know, the way I do things. <laughs> 
Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, now follow Jesus' explanation of this parable about this woman who is persistent. And so basically by badgering this unrighteous judge, this heartless, cruel, evil man is able to get him to do what she's asking. Jesus on the basis of this says, hear the unrighteous judge and will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Do you see what he just did there? He set up a compare and contrast within the parable. Not so much as, hey, you be like the widow, much less as in God is just like the judge, so much as quite the opposite of this. God is nothing like the judge at all. He is not unrighteous, nor not listening, nor not caring, but quite the opposite is your very own father, your dad, as it were, totally and utterly committed to you in all things because you are not a widow who he could care less about, but are his own elect who he has purchased for himself with the very body and blood of his own son, whom he poured out his wrath against all evil on the cross 2,000 years ago. So what are you thinking? That he's not going to listen to you? I tell you quite the opposite. He will answer every prayer you throw his way immediately without waiting or hesitating to send his response. That's the point of the parable. Not, you gotta do more to get God to respond to you, but you don't have to do anything to get God to respond to you. He hears you as soon as you pray and in Christ, his answer is always yes. Now, how do you understand that answer of yes has to do a little bit with, uh, well, how do we say this? Time. As in, is he going to answer that question right now in this immediate moment or is it going to be brought about at Christ's return and the resurrection of the dead? Think, for example, of the Lord's Prayer where we pray, deliver us from evil. Now, truth be told, that can't be done until Jesus comes back. We cannot be delivered from evil so long as we live in a world in which there's evil until Jesus comes back and makes an end of that world of evil. But that prayer is already and always answered entirely in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his justifying work for you, which has delivered you from all evil oh, by faith alone, right? So we walk not by sight, but by faith in this coming reality, which will be. In the same way, every single prayer that you ever throw his way for prosperity or health or wellness or any of the other many daily bread things you need, not to mention that his kingdom would come, that his name would be hallowed, that your sins would be forgiven, all of these are answered already, yes, I promise, in Jesus to be fulfilled by sight on the last day when you're raised from the dead. Does this mean that he never gives you any of the things you ask for in the present? Hardly. He also does this as well, particularly giving the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him for it. I should say for him. But Jesus' point is that when you don't see the prayer immediately being answered, yes, physically, do not lose heart or be discouraged, but remember this totally awesome fact, God is your father. And if he has temporarily said no to your request, for, I don't know, a bajillion dollars, he's probably got a good reason for doing it. And chances are, it has a lot less to do with your personal comfort and pleasure and a lot more to do with your eternal salvation. So if, for example, like Paul's thorn in his flesh, which he confesses was given to him to keep him humble, that is, to given to him to keep from thinking that he was special and righteous on his own so that he would remain in faith in the grace he received in the blood of Jesus, if God says no in this way to you about anything, well, so be it. He's actually protecting you and caring for you. And so even in the suffering circumstances which you give, you can in faith say thanks be to God for what has become. For surely God is working this for the good of the salvation of all the elect in Christ. Hey, I think that sounds like Romans chapter 8, right? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Those words are written by the same guy who confesses in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he actually has been given a demon by God, which is what that thorn in the flesh is, that messenger of Satan. It's on Angelos, angel, an angel of Satan, to harass him, to keep him from being conceited, so that he might always remember the most important thing in the world, the gospel, my grace is sufficient for you. My righteousness is sufficient for you. The power of Christ crucified is sufficient for you. So does this mean that therefore we should go out and pray day and night so we can get what we want because we're going to just badger God into doing it? But, 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 but. Uh, no, that's what the godless people in the parable do that we're not supposed to do at all. Instead, we should, when we see God saying no, not lose heart because we know he said no in order to save us from this world for the life to come. And in this way, continue to cry out day and night in faith for his coming, knowing it will surely occur, knowing that God is most certainly hearing our every word and knowing that all answers are yes in the death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. Now, this answer kind of flows into our next question just a little bit. But first, it's time for your Issues Etc. Question of the Week. 
Pastor Fisk, I recently received a Christmas present that was a copy of The Message. Is this, with an LCMS standpoint, a trusted translation of the Bible? As always, thanks for all you do and Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the message, yeah. We haven't done a ton of talking about translation issues here on Worldview Everlasting, although you do notice that I pretty much am providing you my own translation with every Greek Tuesday. But the message isn't even so much a translation as a really bad paraphrase. This is what happens when relevancy just goes crazy. And Issues Etc. has a two-part series with Dr. Andrew Steinman in which they look at key passages of the message and ask, is this actually what the Bible says? It's worth your time. You can check it out below. <coughs> Email. Can you explain the gospel to me? <laughs> I don't know. Can I? As a former Jehovah's Witness, I have heard the law, law, law. And now I'm a member of an LCMS church, but I seem to be experiencing the same thing. What truly is the gospel? I brought this up with my pastor, but he says the law needs to be preached in order to understand the gospel. Now, I don't know your pastor, so I, I don't want to condemn him. I'm sure he's trying really, really well. But what seems to be happening here is he's not hearing where you are at this point as you ask these questions. And he's kind of not taking into consideration maybe what you personally need to hear versus what your congregation that you're in needs to hear. It is true that as we rightly distinguish law and gospel, the law must in fact be preached. But the kind of hard challenge is that for someone whose ears have been tuned by a life of subservience to a false religion, to a cult like the Jehovah's Witnesses are, that basically make everything about the law in a very direct and specific way, it can be hard to unplug those ears to hear the gospel even when it is being preached. And so you have sort of a special challenge. My guess is, to some extent, your ears are naturally latching onto the law being preached and pulling that home and keeping that as true and sort of skimming over the gospel as if it weren't even there. I can kind of share this idea with you with a story that people have heard before. I wasn't the first one to have this experience myself either, but it certainly happened to me. I know others will have this as well. With my first study Bible, when I started like really getting into reading the Bible and being a Christian, I started highlighting and underlining stuff, right? And I, I did a lot. I mean, my, the, the New Testament was just filled with like highlighted paragraphs and pages and all this stuff. Later though, when I was at seminary and I went back and started using this Bible again, what I found was that I had highlighted almost everything that was about me and what I'm supposed to do and just managed to skim right over all the stuff that was about Jesus. All the proclamation of who he is and what he's done, his death, his resurrection, the imputation of forgiveness and righteousness, the reality that you are reckoned righteous for Christ's sake by faith alone, which doesn't mean by a work of believing, but in fact by receiving a promise that's entirely outside of you by being baptized into his death and resurrection, by being given his flesh and blood at the supper. All that stuff I didn't highlight. I skipped right over it. So my ears, my eyes, my heart was attuned to the law and so that was all it really heard even though the gospel was there. So that's kind of the first thing you got to do in the church that you're in which is go looking for the gospel. Now you've asked what is the gospel? Start with the second article of the Apostles Creed. Let's just kind of let that be the foundation point for what the gospel is. Have it bleed over huh, literally into the third article of the Apostles Creed. Who Jesus is, what he's done, and how the Spirit is bringing this to you now through the church particularly in the words of forgiveness, the communion of the Lord's Supper, the baptism into the resurrection which is coming and the life eternal which is bought and paid for by Jesus and given now as a gift to you that you'll receive in its fullness physically on that day. That is the good news, the victorious war cry, the herald's proclamation of Christianity. Not about what you need to do in any way, shape, or form. You can't do anything. It's a gift placed upon you as a promise. Yay! For someone whose heart has been so destroyed by the law as yours has in that cultic experience, Kneel before Zod! learning to hear that gospel as the real thing and let the law which is being preached, which Christians do still need to hear, not steal the gospel from you, that's going to be a challenge that is only fixed with time. The way that it's fixed with time is that gospel being preached again is going to teach you how to look to it and like be like, oh, that's my reality. That's my identity. That's where I stand in God. Yes, this other stuff about about being good is true, but it is not affecting how God thinks about now. Hear what I'm saying? Now, I would be, uh, admiss. Admiss? Is that a word? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> to not point out that there is the potential that whatever Lutheran church you happen to be in, and there's lots of different kinds of churches out there that have the name Lutheran on the sign, may not actually be preaching the gospel. And I'm concerned that your pastor, when you came to him, you know, hungry for the gospel, didn't give it to you, but instead gave you the statement that you need to hear the law, which again is technically true, but like the whole point of Walther's Law and Gospel, something of a foundational document in the Missouri Synod, is that the duty of the soul 
carer, the spirit healer, the pastor, is not simply to proclaim God's word willy-nilly each direction, assuming that it's always being rightly distinguished, but to also learn to recognize that the hearer may have certain needs at certain times, depending on the state of their soul. So that the Christian who comes to me and says, yeah, pastor, I believe in Jesus, but I think adultery is pretty cool, and I plan to just do that for the next couple of years rather than get married. I think I'm going to sleep around with as many people as possible because it feels good and I'm free in Christ. Well, to that person, no gospel should be spoken at all. There's no forgiveness of sins. You are unrepentant. You deserve to burn in hell and you probably are going to because clearly you don't trust Jesus at all. Otherwise, you'd trust his words that that thing you're saying is awesome is actually evil and destructive. At the same time, a person who comes to me and says, oh, pastor, I have committed adultery. I am so sorry about this. It's something, it was an accident. I, I, no. <laughs> Notice the attempt to justify yourself by saying it was an accident, but I am sorry. I repent. I never want to do it again. Please forgive me. To that person, I'm not going to say, well, do you really repent? You know this was wrong, didn't you? No, they obviously know it's wrong. Instead, I'm going to say, this is what Jesus died for, to cover you with his blood. Distinguishing that law and gospel as it's applied to individual people, something that can't really be done from the pulpit. And so from the pulpit, you are in a faithful church going to hear both law and gospel proclaimed in all their fullness as two different words from God, both entirely true, but only one of which actually saves and thus should predominate that gospel proclamation of who Jesus is and what he's done. But who Jesus is and what he's done is the fulfillment of the very law, which condemns us and guides us in the way that we should go. Jesus himself lived that law perfectly. How then can we, who have been saved from our evil by that living, by that sacrifice, by that atonement, look upon that law and say, well, pff, don't need that anymore. No, we don't say that at all. Instead, we uphold it. We love it. We strive to be good. We strive to love our neighbor as ourselves, recognizing we always fail in that until the last day when the resurrection will make us walk by sight, even as we now confess by faith. And oh, what a blessed day when freed from sinning, I shall see him face to face, clothed then in the blood-drenched linen, totally justified by grace. And I know that's not exactly how the song goes, but that's the point. What is the gospel? Who is Jesus? What he's done for you? That's what Christianity is actually about. The law? Christianity teaches that too, because it's true. But it is a secondary teaching insofar as it's not really the essence, the heart and soul, which is why, if you look at our creed, it's not actually there. I mean, it is in the first article of the created order in the design in which God made us to live, and you gotta go find the Ten Commandments to explain that. But see, this is kind of the point. What does it mean to stand before men and confess Jesus? It's not to stand up and say, hey, all that sin. It's to stand up and say, hey, I'm a sinner, and Jesus died for me anyway. He died for you too. He rose from the dead. He's justified us. He's coming again. Can't wait, because at that point, all this evil is gonna go away. Ah, delivered. Yeah, prayers answered. Yeah, looking forward to it. Hope you are too. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you next time. If you like the show, remember, you can always like it. You can subscribe to the channel. You can share it on Facebook or Twitter or what have you and join the Lutheran Ninja Clan, which helps make it possible by funding our editing and whatnot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Rock on. You will bow down before me! Both you, and then one day, your ass!